First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, in the New Living Translation says, He personally carried away our sins in his own body on the cross. He personally carried them so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. You and I have been healed by his wounds. Notice that he took our sins so that we could be dead to sin. To a point to where sin doesn't even have an attraction for us. And he took upon himself wounds that we can be healed so that sickness and disease cannot stay in us. Come on, praise God. Now, Peter was quoting from Isaiah 53, 5, where Isaiah prophesied he was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. You know, the world is looking for peace. They, they look for peace in all the wrong places. Some type of a drink or a drug or a relationship, they're looking for peace. And God, it literally pleased God to bruise his own son so that we could have peace. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was whipped and we were healed. He was whipped, we were were healed. He was whipped and we were healed. If you're following along with me, taking notes, you can look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12. This is the uh, this is a powerful uh, teaching. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 were powerful teachings where the apostle Paul was teaching the Corinthian church about uh, the gifts of the Spirit. And as you're turning there, I want you to remember how that the woman with the issue of blood, she was healed. And as the story goes, how many remember that Bible story? Jesus was walking along. There were hundreds of people all around him, but he stopped and he said, somebody touched me. Because I felt virtue flow through my body. There were many who touched Jesus that day, but only the woman with the issue of blood experienced the healing because she placed a demand on the anointing that was in him. He felt virtue flowing through his hands or through his body. Because the scripture indicates that we are to follow his example, that we're to do what Jesus did, therefore, I can declare to you today that you have virtue in your body. You have virtue in your body. When you pray, when you touch, when you write a poem, when you sing a song, when you send a text, when you post on Facebook, if you're doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, you are releasing virtue into someone who is hungry and thirsty and placing a demand upon what it is that you have. In 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are the body of Christ. You're members individually. You're not part of some collective like the Borg on 
Star Trek. You're very individual. You're very unique. Some of you are more unique than others. <laughs> but you're part of the body. The body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. He was full of the fullness of God. Therefore, we are filled with the fullness of God. Christ felt virtue flow from his body. Therefore, I should feel virtue flowing through my body. As I speak, as I, as I type, as I preach, as I touch, I am releasing virtue. Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world, preach the good news to everyone, everywhere, and use my authority to cast out devils and heal the sick. When Jesus gives us a directive, instantly we have the resources to fulfill that command. When he said go, within us is all the power, all the resources, all the knowledge, wisdom, everything that we need to accomplish what he sent us to do. And also, in a, in a very real way, you, you've all seen a relay race where maybe there's four runners and the first one takes off, runs around the track, and when they come around, they have to pass the baton to the next runner. In a very real way, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you, and he passes the baton. And he said, if you'll do what you've seen me do, I will empower you with the Holy Spirit and you will do even greater miracles than you've seen me do. The baton has been passed. His virtue is in you. You and I have been given an assignment, a directive and under the influence, the power, the direction of the Holy Spirit, we now release virtue wherever we go. James 5, 14 in the New Living Translation says, Is there any sick among you? They should call for the elders of the church, have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will... Heal the sick, and the Lord will make them well. It's another opportunity to place a demand on the virtue that's within the elders of the church, or the ministry team, or the deliverance team, the healing team. You go to them and you ask, hey, I need some strength here. I need some an anointing here. I, I want to break this yoke. I desire for my healing to be, be made manifest. Because in a very real way, we have been healed. We have been healed. We're in the process of that healing being manifested in our body, soul, mind, spirit, and also, it's true that one day when we get to heaven, we get a brand new body, the ultimate healing. Now, think of this. How many have seen the little TV commercials or whatever videos of the prize patrol arrives at somebody's house and gives them a big, giant check printed on a big cardboard sign? Now, how many know that cardboard sign is not the actual check. How many know that? You can't walk into the bank with the big sign, you know, 
walk into SunTrust Bank, walk in there with that cardboard, they'd look at you like you were from Mars. But that sign says you've just got a million dollars every year for the rest of your life. That's what the sign says. At the moment they place that cardboard sign in your hands, you are now a multi-millionaire. But you have not spent one dime yet. You're still living in the same house, driving the same car, wearing the same clothes. Do I get a witness? Now what you're holding in your hands is greater than some cardboard sign from the prize patrol. You're holding the word of God in paper form or in digital form. Or you're hearing the word of God through the preacher. The spirit of God is even in the very atmosphere when you invited Christ into your life. At that moment, you are full of God. You're full of salvation. You're full of healing. You're full of deliverance. Tell your neighbor, you're just full of it. <laughs> just wanted to see if you were listening. Now listen carefully. When they hand the check, the real check, to the person, they're still in the same house, driving the same car, wearing the same clothes. It's not until they take the check and deposit the check in their account that they have money in the bank. There's an action that is required on our part for the virtue to flow through our spirit man, through our physical body, through our mind, will, and emotions. But even when the money is in the bank, we're still wearing the same clothes, living in the same house, driving the same car. There's additional actions that have to take place. You've got to take that black card that they give you. How many know there is a black card? It's actually made out of a metal. And that black card, you can spend millions with that little black card. That little black card is more powerful than American Express gold card or platinum card. They call it the black card. And you can buy a house with that black card. You can go down to any car dealership. Hey, just here, just put this on the card. Walk out with the nicest, a Lamborghini if you want. Because there is no limit on that card other than what's in the bank. Now you have to understand what you have this morning deposited in your account is greater than. It's greater than. We read the scripture earlier for the offering teaching. When you find the very true wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the very spirit of wisdom, it's greater than even riches. You have to know that what you have in you right now is greater than anything man could ever give you or you could produce with your own hand your own wisdom and you have to believe that you have to believe without faith it's impossible to please God without faith it's impossible to gain that which God has given you you have to come to the realization I do have it. And it's not 
to put on airs or to become arrogant. You don't walk around through town, hey, I got me a black card. Glory to God, I got a black card. You get yourself robbed is what you'll get. <laughs> Somebody will put a gun to your head and say, let's go to the dealership and buy me a car with that card. Glory to God. No, you don't go around flaunting it. You'd be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. But when you are put in a situation where you need to place a demand upon that anointing, you release that anointing. And you and I don't always see the results right in front of us. Sometimes it happens days, weeks later. We just have to release the anointing that God has placed in us and leave the results up to God. You you and I, oftentimes, the vast majority of times, will never know how much that little prayer that you gave at Walmart the other day affects that person's life because unless they have a way to contact you, they can never tell you. Hey, I don't know what you did, but by the next morning, I was totally pain-free. And you'll never know it till you get to heaven. But what I have tried to learn to do is assume the best. When I pray, I actually have come to the point to where I literally expect someone to be healed. I expect someone to get the answer. Amen? Now, faith is the key. Without that faith, it's impossible to please God. You've got to have faith. You've got to have faith that when you touch someone or something, virtue is being released. And I literally use my divine imagination and I feel the power flowing through me. When I when we prayed over the young people today as they're heading out on their missions trip, I consciously release the anointing. I just put my hand towards them and I, I visualize with a divine imagination something's flowing out of the end of my hand and going into their body. I do that. When I'm talking to somebody on the phone or, or I'm typing a, a text message or an email or posting something on Facebook, I'm releasing the anointing. When Dad and I would videotape little TV shows and things and we would pray together and say, Lord, capture this anointing and release it so that people years from now when they're watching the videos they feel the anointing experience the anointing what's the difference between a text message and a prayer cloth you say well it's got to be tangible let me what's more tangible than a text message it's being digitally released and they've now even told us this in physics and so forth that when a beam of light or a sound is released into the atmosphere it never dissipates it just keeps on going Jesus even said if they don't praise me these rocks will cry out and thousands of years later we discover that it's medical particles that are on digital recordings or in record players and so forth that is actually creating the music. Come on, somebody. You've got to recognize that you've got the virtue of God inside you right now, today. You're holding in your hands the check. You can deposit it in your bank account. Don't we even use the phrase, you can take that to the bank and then place a demand on it I, I like to joke around with the people at Publix I just you know the young people that are behind this cash register or the bag boy or girl 
and uh, I hand him my debit card, and, and I'll say things like, I sure hope this works. <laughs> I'll put that in there, and, and I'll read it to him. It says, I'm being processed. <sighs> oh, I've been approved. Thank God, I said, I hate it when it says insufficient funds. And, of course, they're looking at me like I'm weird, you know, some weird old guy. But I love to do that. But let me just tell you right now, you run your Holy Ghost debit card through the machine, and it will never say insufficient funds. Never. Never. You will always be approved. Now, the results and how it all works and how God wants to carry it out, God is sovereign. God does things sometimes totally different than the way we would want it done. For example, how many know the Bible story of Joseph? Joseph was in Pharaoh's prison. He interprets the dreams of two of Pharaoh, uh, two. Uh, staff members of Pharaoh, one would be plunged to his death, the other one would be reinstated to his position with high honor in Pharaoh's court. And of course, it happened. One of the staff was killed, the other staff member was being reinstated. And as he's walking out of the prison, Joseph says to the man, Please remember me before Pharaoh. How many years did Joseph stay in that prison after that? Three more years. What if, what if his prayer was answered at the moment that he did it? He would have been sent home to a dysfunctional family who would have a hard time believing that he was still alive. Number two, he would have to deal with the issue between his father and his brothers who's lied to their father. It would have totally destroyed their family. If he'd been released when he wanted to be released, very possibly the entire Israelite nation would have been lost. But God had another way. That's why it says, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Don't you know that Joseph was destined to be the prince of Egypt? How do we know that? Because he had the dream when he was a young boy. If it would have happened to our son, we would have sent him to Harvard or to Yale, some Ivy League school to prepare him to be the leader of the world. But God puts him in Potiphar's house as a slave, a servant. That was his education. And there wasn't sufficient education, so they had to give him a master's degree. So they put him three floors down into into Pharaoh's dungeon. Learn how to be a trustee in the prison. It's not the way we would have trained our son you and I cannot figure God out how many have discovered God's got a real problem he thinks he's God (laughs) our ways are not his ways faith is your key to healing It is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It takes faith to be saved. There's nobody under the sound of my voice this morning that has loved God for any length of time that doesn't believe without a shadow of a doubt that you've been born again, your name's written on the Lamb's book of life. If something happened to you today, right to heaven you would go. 99% of everybody in the room watching on the recording, you believe that. 
But the same Bible in the same verse says you've also been healed. You've been saved. You've been healed. Somehow we have to get this out of our spirit man into our mind, will, emotions. And in some cases we have to get it out of our natural mind into our spirit. We, some have said you've got to let it float six inches from your brain down to your heart or whatever that little saying is. It's more than six inches. But do you understand? You've got to faith it. It takes faith. Why do we not have trouble believing that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you've never seen the book? You didn't see anybody write anything. You've never seen the contract. It's like getting on Delta Airlines and not even looking to see if somebody's in the cockpit. Most of you get on an airplane, don't even go up there and look and see if somebody's actually there. And when have you ever asked to see a pilot's license? Do you know I've experimented with that? You know I would. I've walked up there, poked my head in, and I said, hey, good morning. And they said, good morning. I said, I just wanted to make sure both of you were here. And I have a big grin on my face. Yeah, we're here. And I said, did both of you had a good night's sleep? Oh, yes, sir. So both of you sober. And, never, and then you can see them. They ain't getting so happy now. So I cut it off right there, and I said, I know you guys will do good because I'm praying for you. And I turn in, and I walk away. I don't recommend that you do everything that I, you know, there's a disclaimer. Don't do what Pastor Stephen does. Any of you ever traveled with Barbara Woodard? Barbara, as we'd get on the plane, she'd reach up, lay hands on the metal of the plane. She'd say, Jesus, protect this plane right now. We, we take so many, I mean, how many of you actually prayed that you'd have a safe journey to church today? Several of you did. There's so many things in life that we take for granted, including our salvation. Why can't we do that with the spirit of the living God regarding healing? Why can't we get to the place by his stripes? I was healed. I am healed. And I receive that healing. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It is the certainty It is confidence and it is certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us even though we cannot see it up ahead. That's what faith is. By his stripes, I'm healed. How are you doing today? I'm healed. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored of the Lord. Snot's running down your nose. Your cough and your eyes are all puffy. I'm healed. Doesn't look like you're healed. I'm healed. Now, back in the day, we used to call that deception. We were deceiving ourselves because the faith people told us to say those things. And we threw the baby out with the bathwater. It was absolutely accurate. The problem was it was done flippantly. It was tried to be accomplished through a head knowledge. It's got to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. You've got to have the spirit of faith working inside of you, and you say it until you get it. The woman with the issue of blood kept saying to herself, 
If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be healed. If I can just touch him, if I can just touch him, if I can just touch him. And she pressed through the crowd, if I can just touch him, if I can just touch him. And she kept reaching for his garment. And you heard the poem today. Mavis did a phenomenal job. You heard the poem today that we need to be seeking the healer instead of the healing. If I can just touch him, I will be healed. Well, in the new covenant, the healer is now inside of us. Let me try this church over here because I don't think that church over on that side heard what I just said. The healer is now inside of me. We have the spirit of the living God living inside of me. So I don't have to pray something down. I have to pray something up. Somehow I've got to unlock my spirit man and let him affect my mind, my will, my emotions, my physical body. Somehow I've got to let him out. Turn to your neighbor and say, let Jesus out. We fix our eyes on Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Because we will go through times when our faith is weak or our faith is not strong. And that's when we say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. How do we build our faith? How do we build faith in others? Romans says... Not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? Yet faith comes from listening to the message of the good news, the good news about Christ. Hey, how you doing? I went to the doctor. Doctor told me I got cancer. Oh, man, my, my Uncle George, he died of cancer. Isn't it funny that everybody's so quick to tell you all the worst case scenarios when you get an affliction? Yeah, I'm feeling bad. I got a pain right over here. Oh, my Aunt Mary had a pain right there. She died. (laughs) Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Some of you remember Lisa Williams, former member of our church. She's now working with uh, Wayne and Maddie Freed over at Believer's Fellowship. And Lisa's son was hit by a car when he was riding his bicycle just down the road here from the church. And, and he became virtually a vegetable and very little brain activity. And she had the nurse write it on the chart. Don't you let any doctor, don't you let any technician, don't you let any nurse, don't you let any visitor in this room that's got a negative attitude and has anything other than he's going to recover. We're giving him a good report. She She said, even when... They need to tell me what's going on. They better do it with a positive attitude or I'll throw them out. It's written on the chart, and she did. She threw one doctor out. She said, don't ever let that doctor into my son's room again. Threw him out, and he was one of the top guys in the, in the whole place. And the other doctors kind of walked in, you know. <laughs> Am I going to get thrown out, you know? She raised that boy from the dead. She got two more years, and then he was hit by a car again. He's in the hospital, and she started to go through the same routine again, and this time the Holy Spirit spoke to her, and and he said, his time on earth is over. I gave you two more years. Now let him go. How many are glad you didn't have God talk to you like that? 
But you've got to know Lisa if you know Lisa that, you know, God had to smack her upside the head to get her to listen. That was humor. Relax. <laughs> Faith comes. I'd never had, I'd never had anybody healed in my ministry that had been born deaf. I'd had a few people that had had some kind of hearing damage or something, maybe from a war wound or an accident or something, but I'd never had anybody born deaf healed in my ministry. And one year, I was traveling with uh, Larry Rovath. He was a um, right-hand man to Morris Sorello, and I'd met Larry through uh, Dr. Horvath. And Larry and I were doing the opening night of the rally in the Philippines because Dr. Horvath was coming the next night. So Larry and I are up there ministering together. And I'd never ministered side by side with Larry. But if you've seen Larry, you've seen Morris Sorello. Some of you, how many even know who Morris Sorello is? Oh, thank God, there's a few. Okay, so we're up there ministering. And Larry gets up. And he's like all over the place. I mean, I don't think Larry even knows how to preach a three-point sermon. I mean, it's point one, point six, point four, backs up, redoes point one again, makes it sound like it's point two, but it's really point one. Larry's just all over the place. He flows. And, uh, and I'm standing up there, and I'm trying my best to just try to fit in because he's the experienced man of God, and I was just learning how to do crusades. And, and we call up the sick people, and they, and they bring up this little eight-year-old girl who was born deaf. And Larry starts working with this little girl five minutes, ten minutes, and I can see the crowds getting restless. There's probably 5,000 people there in the big open-air park in the Philippines, and I'm getting nervous, and Larry won't stop. He just keeps going after it. He prays this way, that way, up, down, inside, out, puts his finger in his ears. He whispers. I mean, he does everything. 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, her ears pop open, and she's looking all around. And here comes her mother and father running to the platform. And what we didn't know was he was the director of the whole crusade in the Philippines and it was their child and everybody in the place knew who it was and she was instantly healed. Wow. So I'm now, I think it was a few weeks later, maybe a month later, I go to uh, Nicaragua to minister and I was doing a big tent uh, crusade there for Dr. Spencer and, and uh, he's a big, huge church, he was the preferred interpreter for Benny Hinn, and had just interpreted for Benny Hinn there in Nicaragua two months before. And I'm doing a, a crusade, a healing crusade in his tent. And we're up there, and uh, um, incredible signs, wonders, and miracles. And then Sunday night, I go to this little chapel on the city dump. And it's a chapel that my dad's first church, First Assembly of God here in Lakeland, actually had built that little church. They called it the tabernacle for the Buenos, who were missionaries. And so I was excited that I was getting to preach in a, you know, in the church that my dad's congregation had built. And, and, uh, I'm looking at 50 people. I just preached to thousands in the big tent. And I'm now looking at 50 people, and they're all sitting there, and they're looking at me, and they're right out of the dump. Just right out of the dump. They live in the dump. There's like 3,000 of them that live in the dump. And I'm looking at this, and I'm just telling you, you know, I, I've, I preach hard whether there's 5,000 or there's 50. But emotionally, it still has an effect on you. 
when you've got a packed out house versus 20 people, it still has, there's, it, it, it has an effect on you physically. And then I'm already tired because I had just prayed for 2,000 people by hand, every single person in the big tent in about 85, 90 degree weather. And now I'm inside this little chapel that's about 95 degrees, no air condition. I'm soaked to the skin. And I get two or three people healed. And I'm almost done. I said, I'm saying to myself, I'm going back to the hotel, take a shower, get something to eat, and start all over tomorrow. And all of a sudden, the little old lady, bag lady, as we would call her, is on the front row, and she starts pawing her ears. She looked to be 50, 60 years of age, not properly dressed, no undergarments, just clothes literally draped over her, hadn't had a bath in maybe a year, sitting on the front row with maybe four teeth in her mouth, and she's pawing her ears going, yeah, 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 and she's looking all around the room. Well, I'm thinking she's mentally disturbed. Seriously, I mean, that's what I just thought. She was just, you know, a mentally disturbed person that they had brought from the, the dump. And I turned to my interpreter and said, hey, what's going on? He said, her ears just popped open. I said, what are you talking about? He said, she's the deaf lady. I said, what do you mean she's the deaf lady? She's born deaf here in the city dump, and she, her ears just popped open. Oh, yeah. And there's more to the story. I mean, Tuesday night I was doing a rally. I see her out in the audience. I ask her to come up, and, and I'm getting her to testify. And as she's coming up, it suddenly dawns on me. She, she doesn't know how to speak because she was born deaf. She's never even heard the language or anything. She doesn't know nothing. And she comes up, and in her broken Spanish that she had learned by lip re- reading... She was 38 years of age. She looked like she was 50 or 60. 38 years of age, born deaf. And she is just jabbering and jabbering and jabbering in Spanish. My interpreter says, she's got a song for you. And I said, she's got, let the girl sing. And she sings a song that she had written for me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And she sang it like 50 times. And the glory of God fell and just hit the whole place. (laughs) But I got back to my hotel room and I'm meditating on what just happened. And the Holy Spirit said, you now can believe God for death mutes because you saw a deaf mute healed see faith comes when you see it happen faith comes when you hear the word of God when you hear a testimony the power of God is even in a testimony And you also heard within the testimony that I didn't even pray for. I didn't have any faith left. I didn't even have the physical strength left. But because there is virtue in this body, and I was there, and I was engaged, and I just did the best I could, and God did the miracle. It was shortly after that, a couple of months later, I'm in India. And I'm doing a conference for Dr. Samuel, who's a member of our church. And I'm doing a conference for Dr. Samuel. And and it was time to heal the sick. And, you know, I'm expecting a few bad backs or maybe somebody with stomach trouble or maybe a goiter or something. You know, those, they bring me a deaf boy. Born deaf, eight years old. And they bring him up on the platform, and he's the pastor's son. 
And I just take a deep breath and I say, in the name of Jesus. Just like that. And I purposely did it that way. Because if you ever go with me to India, to Dr. Samuels, they all pray like they were Church of God evangelists from the 1950s. In the name of Jesus. They, all, they do that. I, it's, it's funny. I can say, in the name of Jesus. And the interpreter will go, in the name of Jesus. And I'll say, stop that. Do what I do. And they look at me. They say, Brother Strader, if you, if you want to be anointed, you've got to speak loud and fast. And I go, no, I don't. Do what I do. I have to rebuke them in front of everybody. It's hilarious. <laughs> I purposely said, Jesus, heal the little boy. And his ears just popped open. And the first words I whispered in his ears were English. He's never heard English, never heard Malayalam, their native language. I whispered in his ear, I love my mom. The first words his mother ever heard the child say was, I love my mom. And then just to be sure, just to be sure, I whispered in his ears, I love ice cream. Now, he's never had ice cream. He doesn't know what ice cream is. And for him to say it, perfect English, I love ice cream. I knew he was hearing. Because now I believed. I'd seen it. I'd read it. I'd heard the testimonies. I believed. You want to hear one more story? I was preaching for Lynn Bracco down in Fort Myers. And I was there for a series of two or three nights of meetings. And I think it was the final night. We'd had a grand time. People were healed, delivered, saved. It was back in the revival days. People laughing. People filled with the Holy Spirit. And we had a wonderful service that night. Two, three hours long. Just people basking in the glory of God. And frankly, I was getting tired. It was the third night. And And when I got finished, I sat down on the front row. She's going to get up and receive the love offering for our ministry. And I'm sitting there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What a great night. God, you're so good. And I get a tap on my shoulder. And I turn around, and the lady said, this is my neighbor. She's deaf. She's born deaf. And she can read your lips and, and she's been able to kind of follow things, but she is scared to death of you. <laughs> Can you imagine? Anybody scared of me? But she came tonight because I told her that Jesus could heal her deafness. So I looked at the lady, and she, her eyes are big like this, and she is squishing as far away from me as she can into her chair like this, literally. So I just held out my hand, and I I let her read my lips. I said, put your hand in my hand. She put her hand in my hand, and instantly her ears opened, and she heard for the first time. That fast. I didn't even pray. Do you understand the virtue is in your body? It's not, it's not just for the evangelist or the apostle or the preacher or the healing room, the healing team. It's for you every day on the job. You don't have to walk around laying hands on people. In the name of Jesus. You, know, you don't need to do that. As a matter of fact, if I catch you doing that, I'll smack you. But you can just take somebody by the hand and say, Jesus, touch my friend. Amen. That's all you got to do. It doesn't take a big flowery prayer. 
It takes faith to release the anointing that when your hand touches their hand, when they read your poem, when they hear your song, when they read your text, when they hear your voice, they're healed because of the virtue in you. Matthew 4, people brought anybody with any ailment, whether mental, emotional, or physical, and Jesus healed them all one by one. Matthew 8, 16, they brought to him many who were under the power of demons, and he drove out the spirits with a word and restored to health all who were sick. Matthew 12, Jesus healed them all. Luke 4, no matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed every one. Luke 6, 19, everyone was trying to touch him because healing power went out from him and they were all cured. We are now the body of Christ. And you have virtue in your hands. The disciples, even before they were filled with the Holy Spirit, in Luke 10, you can read the story, Jesus just sent them because they were sent by him. They came back rejoicing, saying that even the demons were subject to us. We healed people just like you did. Why? Because they were going forth in the same anointing and power because he had commanded them to go. And that's when the famous scripture, when Jesus said these words, I've given you power. I've given you power. They haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. He gave them power. They hadn't even cashed the check yet. I've given you power. They hadn't even pulled any money out of the account yet. I've given you power. And it was a few days after Pentecost that Peter is walking down the road and he sees the lame man. He sees the lame man. It's a few days after the resurrection, after the, the ascension. Jesus has gone up into the clouds and he's told them, this same Jesus you've seen, the angel said, this same Jesus you've seen go up into the clouds in like manner will come again. Now go into all the world, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, preach the gospel. So Peter's walking on the road, on the, way into church and he's walking into the church into the chapel into the synagogue and there's a lame man who's been there all the, that time he's been there for probably 20 years but this time Peter sees him and this morning because of this message you are now going to begin Seeing people. You'll see them. You won't be afraid to pray with them. You won't be afraid to give them a kind word and say, you know what? God loves you. He's going to help you get through this. You're going to say it with confidence. And Peter says to the lame man, look at me. And the Little beggar, he's got his little tin cup and he's holding it up, expecting some coins before the worshiper in the temple is going to go in to worship. That's why he's sitting there. He's hoping that God's love in the worshipers as they're going in the temple are going to be kind and gracious to him. So that's why he's sitting at the gate beautiful. He can't go inside. You know why he can't go inside? Because he's defective. He's not allowed in the temple. He's deformed. He's defective. He's a lame man. And you've got to understand, they ain't coming in here. You've got to go out there. 
They're out there. They feel defective. They feel deformed. They're not going to come in here. They're not dressed good enough. They don't feel comfortable enough. They don't know what we're doing in here. As far as they know, we're handling snakes. Do you handle snakes in your church? Yes, sir, I do. Oh, wow. What's that like? Well, Jesus said you can trample serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will hurt you. But I said, we don't handle live snakes like that. I said, but the Bible calls demons snakes and scorpions, and we handle those. We kick them out. He goes, whoa, dude. (laughs) I get funny responses. (laughs) You're on a plane sometime, they ask you, what do you do? I handle snakes. That'll change the conversation right there. (laughs) I've never done it, but I have thought about it. He says to the beggar, I don't have any silver and gold, but such as I have. I've got a deposit of a big check in my account. I've got the glory of God in me. And such as I have, I give to you. And he takes the man by the hand and he lifts lifts him to his feet. You have virtue in your hands. Look at your hands. Look at your hands right now. Look at your hands. In these hands, some old and wrinkled, some young and strong, some black, some white, some Asian, some mixed, some Heinz variety, some you don't even know what you got. You went to Ancestor.com and they rejected you. Let me tell you this right now. In these hands is virtue. It's virtue. You can heal AIDS and cancer and diabetes and heart disease. You can raise the dead with that hand. Because his virtue is inside you. Come on, lift up both hands to God right now. Lord, we just declare and decree as a church body this morning everyone watching by digital device or those here in this room we lift our hands and we say we receive your truth by faith we believe that these are anointed hands this is an anointed body it's filled filled with the glory of God and I'm going to go forth from this house today, full of God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We walk by faith. Let me ask you a question. Look right up here at the preacher. How many of you know that you know that you know you have money in your bank account today? If you took your debit card to the restaurant today, you know that it would work. How many know that? Let me ask you a question. Do you feel the money in the bank? Do you feel it? And unless you have an app on your phone right now that you could actually call up and see the balance on your account, how do you know that you have money in the bank? That's what faith is. You have to understand, I have just told you under the anointing and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and you've read the scriptures with your own eyes, you've heard. You got virtue in your bank. Now go and use it. That's an order. It's a command from God himself. Go and use it.
Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. If there is anybody in this room that you came here this morning and your heart isn't right with God and you want to make it right, just wave at me right now. I just want to I just want to pray with you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just raise your hand if you need to make things right with God. Thank you. Thank you for that hand in Jesus' name. Let's all pray this prayer with them to encourage them. And I'm going to encourage these people that have raised their hand to pray this prayer. Everyone together. Heavenly Father, the best way I know how, I open my life to you. Jesus, I have sinned against you. And I ask you to forgive me. Come into my life. Change me. Take the bad stuff out. Put the good stuff in. In Jesus' name, I give you my life. Come on, lift your hands afresh and anew right now, all of us. I give you my life. Now, I want to challenge those of you that just prayed with me before you leave this room. Just walk up here. Privately, I'm not going to make a show of you or anything. Just You just walk up to me. After I dismiss everybody, walk up to me, shake my hand and say, Preacher, I prayed that prayer with you. And that will just seal the deal. Okay? Amen. Hadn't this been a great Sunday? Yes. Lift your hands. Lord, bless them. Keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Bless them in their going out and their coming in. I pray that you'll give them somebody to heal today, somebody to release virtue in today. Give them somebody that needs what they have in their body. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Give somebody a hug. If you're new to the church, come up and say hi. Those of you that prayed with me, come up and say hello. God bless you. Those of you on the webcast, we are glad that you joined us today. Write to me. Tell me where you saw this broadcast. Ignitedchurch at gmail.com. Ignitedchurch at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. God bless you.